Welcome to the 15th episode of Speaking of Poetry. I am Rennie McQuilkin, publisher of Antrim House Books, whose authors are featured in this series. And today I am delighted to be joined by Barry Zarrett, whose first book of poems, Journeys, has just been published by Antrim House. National Book Award winner Sherwin Newland says this about the book. Barry Zarrett is gifted with extraordinary perception and understanding as well as the ability to see empathically into the very souls of himself and of others. Here, he looks unflinchingly at his own and our pain and sorrow and at death, ultimately finding a future of promise and fulfillment. His lines are crafted with love. In his other life, Barry Zarrett is a renowned cardiologist at the Yale New Haven Medical Center where he was for many years chief of cardiology. He's also on the faculty of the Yale University School of Medicine and is recognized for his pioneering research in the development of nucle nuclear cardiology. He has written or edited five medical texts and has received many awards for his scientific work. Barry Zarad is also an accomplished painter, as you can see from the sample on the front cover of Journeys. He lives in Woodbridge, Connecticut, and also has a home in the Berkshires. Barry is a man who wears many hats, and we are fortunate that he has been able to find time to be with us today wearing his poetry hat. Welcome to Speaking of Poetry, Barry Zarrett. Thank you, Rennie, for your very gracious introduction. I'd like to begin with a poem uh, about my roots, about my father. Uh, a man who traveled Europe and finally made it to the United States, worked very hard in his little butcher shop, uh, cared enormously about his family and his son, and taught me more about life than any professor. My father's kosher butcher shop. For years, my father served the Jewish families of Far Rockaway from behind the counter of his little butcher shop. His large following traveled miles for ritually proper meat, ladies first previewing the small outer window display, then entering the cold store to order, bargain, schmooze. He glided with tango grace on the sawdust-covered floor, smiling, cajoling, humoring, slicing, weighing, wrapping, carrying large slabs of meat in muscular forearms, from the store's rear walk-in refrigerator. Cap on his head, cigarette never far away, pencil behind his ear, bill added on brown paper bag. Thursday stretched from well before dawn until late in the evening. After Shabbat dinner, he collapsed and slept enough that night for the whole week. He worked so very hard, scratched out a living, was cheated by his partner, Devastated, he sold the store but never lost his spirit. Occasionally, I delivered orders or just helped out. When I started college, the store supplied my chemistry lab attire, a long butcher's coat, new, pristinely white, untouched by calf blood. It served me well while mixing reagents and precipitating salts. When accepted to medical school with scholarship, I was headlined. Butcher's boy makes good. My father beamed. I liked the alliteration. My friends thought it hilarious. But they never looked inside this loving butcher whose youth far from Rockaway shore contained enough pain to fill 50 lives. A hurtful montage of pogrom, orphanhood, hunger, poverty, betrayal, care of two young sisters, travel to foreign lands, a forgiving butcher, gentle and wise, wearing his scars but not consumed by them, living his immigrant dream when his only son was called doctor. I was proud to be this butcher's boy. Next up, I'd like to read a poem written uh, in memory of my closest friend, who I first met at age 11, uh, and we remained friends throughout his life. During uh, the course of his life, I also became his physician. For Lou Herman, 
In winter, we cleared snow from the playground court with our mother's brooms. We ran from hoop to hoop, youngsters transplanted from Brooklyn and Bronx to Rockaway's shore, legs churning, elbows flying, fighting for rebounds, hook shots, layups, immortality's boys with no fears, no hang-ups, only the next basket and playing away the next hormone surge. We cleared our pimples and felt like men, tall for our age, same birthday, Corsican brothers of Queens, high stool sitters at the Five Spot Cafe, listening to Monk, faking our age, sipping beer at the bar, inhaling our smoke while hiding our coughs. Then to college, medicine, law careers, no time for hoops, no time for fun, only hopes and dreams. We married, had families, settled, grew, lived the highway apart, still close. You became my patient. For 23 years, your ECG defined you differently. I saw your sternum split and new blood routes created for your starving heart. Mortality is now with us, worn on our shoulders each day, each night. Then so suddenly, no longer young, we each faced different challenges, tried to make them like fast breaks on the playground court. But challenges are met for only so long. You slumped at your desk and you were gone, long before the sirens reached Bellevue's door. Now your ashes mixed with Rockaway's sand, gray specks on a white canvas. I said Kaddish for you for 30 days. You wouldn't have wanted that, but what is a brother to do? When I visit my parents' graves, I will stop at our beach and watch the waves, looking for gray specks glistening on white sand. Perhaps then I will believe what still seems unreal for one of immortality's boys. One of uh, the most important and sacred rituals in Jewish life involves ritual circumcision called in Hebrew Brit Milah. It is at that time that the young baby boy, eight days after birth, undergoes this procedure, is welcomed into the Jewish faith and given his Hebrew name. This poem is dedicated to my grandson, Solomon Zaret. Brit Milah. At a round table covered with white cloth, topped by soft pillow, I prepare for honored duty in the ancient ritual, naming my grandson forever as a Jew. I've been here before, yet each trip leaves my body limp. I sit at the table, talit wrapped, summoning images that link generations seen and never seen. The slain family hanging limply from snow-covered trees in Russian winter woods. The murdered grandfather for whom I'm named. My always loving father, whose eyes lit the night when speaking of his grandsons. The baby is placed on the pillow, vulnerably secure, surrounded by love and anticipation. My restraining hands lie lightly on his small, fragile thighs. He sleeps oblivious to what will follow, senses dulled by sweet wine. The sharp knife's swift movement, steeped in millennia of experience, is performed to perfection. Only a soft whimper from his tender mouth. I return him to my son. The small party begins. Sleep well, my grandson. Now you've joined the rest of us. Wear your name proudly without fear of predators. No need to seek safety in cold winter woods. Sleep well, my forebears. Your sacrifice is done. Your names, our name, live in new worlds propelled by memories not to be forgotten. The holiday of Sukkot occurs in autumn. It's a festival of happiness uh, in the Jewish religion, uh, during which time we built small shelters called uh, sukkah, uh, sukkah or Sukkot, uh, and we eat there for uh, about a week. 
this poem uh, deals with the holiday, but also to a favorite singer of mine, uh, the great Leonard Cohn. Inviting Leonard Cohn to our sukkah. Dear Leonard, you're invited to our sukkah. I know you're touring again. If you're on the East Coast, please come. Surely you remember Sukkot from your Montreal youth, our people's time of joy, a welcome relief after Yom Kippur's solemnity, a week of celebration mixed with the transience of hand-built fragile huts and harvest spirituality. We'll view the stars through the thatched sukkah roof, properly greet our forefathers' spirits, and you, the night's spiritual guest, will mingle with Abraham and Isaac. We'll talk, eat, drink, and sing. Fall New England nights can be chilly. Bring a sweater. I missed your peak when we both were young. You grew famous while I raised a family and chased academic gold. I've come late to your music, but it's now with me daily, on the treadmill, walking patient hall, hospital halls, sitting in the hot tub, your anthem metaphor gave my dying patient hope. She lived six more months. There's much to discuss. Moses and Buddha, Suzanne, famous blue raincoat. When you stood in synagogue and heard Yom Kippur's Who by Fire or chanted Hallelujah. We'll be discreet, no other guests. You choose the subjects. I'm only suggesting it's our people's time of joy. Let's be joyous together. Do come if you can. Sincerely, B. Zaret. It's been mentioned that I am a physician, and I think being a physician uh, informs my poetry, and uh, they work together in, in a wonderful interaction. Uh, this poem was written about four years ago. Uh, it's called 42 Years. 42 years I've been called doctor. Six letters defining me as much as husband, father, son. First as new intern, so eager, so fearful. Dressed in white pants and jacket, stiff with yesterday's starch. Now professor's name is stitched on my soft white lab coat. Draped on stooping shoulders as I stride the boundaries of my hospital domain. I've cared for patients in the same clinic for more than three decades. Some have been with, with me almost as long. Many have now grown frail. Others are no longer here. We age together. I wear them around my neck like a long string of pearls, each self-contained the lesson of illness, healing, or death, each a reminder of a privileged state, my six-letter name. They've kept me whole over decades in the lab and at the desk. I still pain when they fail and feel the rush of interns' joy when they recover. A bit surprising after 42 years. If ever the feelings cease, I'll nestle my stethoscope in the desk's lower drawer and with some remorse begin reading the many books that have been waiting a lifetime for me. This poem... Uh, is also about doctoring, uh, and it deals with a very special patient who I cared for for over two decades. The poem describes uh, our relationship during the last seven months of her life, where she lived in the Jewish home for the aged. Stride up the incline toward the patient wing, a windowless hallway with institutional green walls, knowing neither sun nor shade, an ascent into decline. Past the wall of memorial boards covered with brass plaques, marking residents who ended life here, as if a reminder is necessary. Then under the ceiling that leaks in heavy rains, next the courtyard where some sit in wheelchairs, still enjoying their cigarettes. Finally, the wings double doors, guarding entry and exit. Since my patient transferred, I come here often. I've cared for her over 20 years. I doubt we'll make 21. My feet know the way without me. The staff greet me. I'm a regular. 
Decay is pervasive in both the drab walls and those within them. Odors of dried urine and body lotion blend. The two dance together just below the ceiling, an olfactory canopy of despair and resignation. Medicine now does little for my patient's frail 92-year body. Infirmity succumbs to infirmity, yet her mind remains firm. Poetry, photos, and stories replace new pills and procedures. They work for short periods, bring smiles to her thin, saddened face. I will continue these visits despite their pain. Abandonment is not an option. On the final part of our journey, caring has replaced healing. Soothing has replaced science. Perhaps one of the most devastating uh, events in one's life uh, is dealing uh, with fatal illness uh, in one's spouse. Uh, this is something that I went through. The next few poems talk about this. Man plans and God laughs. Man plans and God laughs. My father, a shtetl existentialist, told me hundreds of times in a charming Yiddish imbued with wisdom learned in life, not books. I had to wait till college in Camus and Sartre to understand what he learned as a young teenager. Man plans and God laughs. Murnam and I had calculated our future with anticipated precision. Then celestial laughter erased the blueprints, canceled the trips, removed the many joys we thought awaited us. We live in the land of cancer, a surreal place, filled with plans and no plans, dreams and no dreams, hope and no hope, reality and no reality. I try not to plan now, so I hear no laughter, only the beating of an inner heart, a clock that seeks to push time backward, reliving 50 years together. In caring for someone uh, who has a serious illness, we develop different strategies to get through each day. This is about one such strategy. It's called pill count. It started in winter when chemo weakened her as never before. Morning and evening, I began counting pills, preparing her medications, both those that eased and those that damaged. Readying each pill was my act of love. Now in summer, I continue the routine, although she is often stronger, capable of doing this herself. In the land of cancer, the multicolored pills provide a palette for new art, at the same time concrete and abstract. I welcome the task. Treatment yields hope, even if illusory. May the ritual continue, like all the other survival methods, linking us together as we cope day by day in the land of cancer. Facing disease often produces a host of feelings, one of which is anger. This is called God of Cancer. God of Cancer, you are an evil tease. You give us scattered hours, even days of happiness and ease. Then you take it all back, replaced with weakness, pain, sleeplessness, fear. God of Cancer, you are a relentless foe, one I cannot defeat no matter my plan. If you were a man, I would grasp your throat and squeeze with every ounce of my strength until your face blued and your breath ceased. I would stand over your lifeless body with arms raised despite my oath to heal. But you are not a man and I am not a god. Let us continue the struggle. I will not concede, even as you make the rules, you evil tease, you relentless foe. We, uh, we all deal with that spectrum of feeling, 
and then uh, there is a time when it's over and we have to try to reconstitute which is a complicated process this poem describes the beginning an early phase of this reconstitution wall talk when the god of cancer took you for himself and shiva ended our life's home void of companionship was engulfed in the cold cloak of loneliness time filled by tv sports crossword puzzles mindless magazines then as with survivors before me wall talk filled the void wall talk words spoken with responses reverberating back sonar like fears voiced needs expressed questions asked blame dispensed problems solved frustrations laid bare the companion walls never ignore attentive to each issue silently helping the questioner answer himself sometimes wall talk is interrupted by tears then dialogue ends human beings are quite resilient and we do recover this poem written about a year ago uh, ironically enough shortly uh, after the snowstorm in october uh, deals with that snow in october heavy snow in october how odd with sukkot recently ended and autumn colors not fully manifest limbs of still green leaf trees crack and fall under snow's weight power losses abound whole towns paralyzed i stand awed by nature's deadly game thankful to be spared at least for now this is new england not the rockies snow never falls in october too much to comprehend after recent hurricane and floods odd occurrences suited for odd times but the unusual no longer surprises as we warm globally the unexpected has become routine former losers now winners did life not balance my recent grief charting a new course to navigate the white waters of these odd times a further poem on the phenomenon of coming back after great sorrow this winter's pond last night's rain melted the pond's first ice covering i awaken to hemlock and cloud reflections a winter rarity soon the morning's late december chill again induces water to freeze and reflections to vanish new light snow whitens the fresh ice and sugars the shore with tasty frosting while winds gently course laurel and hemlock into graceful movement no car noise or children shouts across the pond only the sounds of pencil on paper and peaceful breathing as i look from my desk the cold landscape warms my eyes and invites me to enter am i the only person living this moment solitude's quiet once my oven for reheating memories no longer causes sorrow i have regained my berkshire haven last year's loneliness today's serenity the berkshires uh is a place that has been very important to me for a long time and a place where i write as well as think and paint this in the next poem uh, talk about berkshire beauty snow dams last night snow covers woods and frozen pond like a freshly made bed hemlock boughs laden by snow's weight bend supply arch downward and interlace are they burdened or just resting waiting for a wind gust to initiate their undulating dance when that movement comes slowly and gracefully they release their snow oriental dancers shedding their veils free of added weight bows leap skyward the ballet concludes in the morning blueness the air is still 
Cold stings my cheeks and burns my fingers, but my eyes scan the floor, seeking the ideal hemlock to partner in the next dance. Berkshire Light. An hour before dusk in a Berkshire summer, hemlock branches glow in the western sun. They turn yellow and orange and their underbellies shadow darkly. Their dimensions deepen with each minute. In that hour I pray sunset never comes. I live in a hopper world of bold color and contrast. I want nothing more. We sit in the tub watching the trees change while they watch us. Below the pond glistens. The water reflects a quiet sky of pink and vermilion. Above us a cloud of insects hover, always moving, but only side to side. They never come close. Perhaps in this hour, they concede we belong here too. Some, uh, this last poem uh, addresses uh, the past and the future. The tree and the vine. When walking my long driveway, I often pause to view a special tree and the leafy vine encircling the trunk as it spirals skyward. From afar they are as one, but up close there are separate roots. The tree stands with sturdiness endowed by decades of growth. The vine, a newcomer, thin yet robust, ascends serpiginously with DNA grace. In spring the two bloom side by side. In autumn their leaves turn gold together as if responding to a common cue. Throughout the year they remain wrapped in embrace. Much like future and past, they've learned the secret of living together. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. Uh, you've taken us on, on quite a journey uh, from the Frau Rock, Fire Rockaway son of a butcher to, uh, to a, uh, a reveler inviting Leonard Cohen to Suka, uh, to uh, a uh, doctor who treats his patient with poems as well as with pills, uh, to a, a husband who, who is losing his wife to the god of cancer, uh, to a, uh, a grappler who would just as soon strangle or wishes to strangle that god of cancer, uh, to a man who's come back to, to, uh, to life in the Berkshires and the joy of it and is uh, courageous enough to throw himself back into life after, uh, after such an experience. What a journey uh, you've taken us on. Thank you for that. Thank you very much, and thanks for the privilege of reading. A great privilege indeed. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Ken Picard and Karen Hanville, who make this program possible. And to remind you that if you would like to learn more about Barry Zarrett and read samples of his work, please do visit the Antrim House website, antrimhousebooks.com. You may also be interested in other Antrim House poets whose lives and works are described on the website. For now, goodbye until we meet again next month for the 16th installment of Speaking of Poetry. <laughs>